Okay, this section here discusses Jeanne and other recent uh, changes to Hadoop, in particular Hadoop 3, although Jan came in with Hadoop 2. And uh, but Hadoop is still making significant changes. And that's going to be important because there are many applications, as I kind of stress, that just need Hadoop. We really want to, and that's probably, I don't know, 75% of all big data jobs. So we better make those run like uh, as fast as possible with the greatest efficiency and the greatest possible fault tolerance. All right, so here we are, the fifth part of this particular slide set on Hadoop and map bridges. So here is a sort of picture um, from actually Apache Tez, one of the uh, um, Things added in Hadoop 2. And basically, Hadoop 1.0 did something important. It, changed, it decided to build a toolkit out of itself. And in fact, in our opinion, it could have gone a lot further. And both it and Spark can benefit by becoming toolkits. And then you will find Hadoop is one set of tools in the toolkit, Spark is another, Twister is a third, and so on. And here we have. Um, the file system, the resource management, where actually you can substitute Kubernetes or Mesos, as it says here. And then we have at the top here, uh, we have uh, the various MR, P, Hive, which are the different uh, enhancements to Hadoop. And we have streaming services, and we have database services. So Hadoop 3 has significant improvements over Hadoop 2. Um, Hadoop 3 supports GPUs. And it not only uses containers, but it uses Docker. And we know that Docker is, what is Docker? It's just a container, Linux container, pretty old fashioned technology, but all spruced up to make it easy to use. And uh, storage has been done significantly better. There's better support for small files and things like that. And we now have multiple name nodes, so you can get redundancy for name nodes. And something we haven't mentioned, the timeline service, which is sometimes called provenance in the community I work on, which defines all the, all the pieces of information that uh, specify how we ran, how long we took, and what we did, and things like that. Called provenance, metadata. All right, so there are several ways of getting redundancy. Actually, the one that is most famous was used in RAID disks, which is um, not RAID 1, RAID, RAID, the higher orders of RAID. They use parity checks to be able to uh, get the redundancy in an efficient fashion. And as the later slides will point out, if you do basic replication, like make six copies as uh, S3 does, uh, that is pretty, pretty robust, but it uses six times as much disk space. There are other technologies which use significantly less disk space, are equally robust, uh, but they do have one non-trivial problem. They use, they need Everything that's fetched off disk has, needs to be computed to be able to disentangle it. Because it's all got a transformation applied to it to make it uh, highly robust. So erasure coding or Solomon erasure coding, erasure coding is, a, is a standard technique used in RAID disks. And you just, if you happen to lose one part of your data, then you can reconstruct it using the parity. Now we want to do this on a smaller grain size than the original grain size, because otherwise it becomes too clumsy and too inefficient. All right, so this is three-way replication. That's what Google did in the beginning of time. That's assuming that time began in 2000, around 2000. Um, and it is very simple, it's trivial to scale, it's highly robust. And as I say, you um, can even use six-way replication in Amazon 
uh, to get Amazon S3 to get even more robustness. Now, of course, it's a little wasteful because the secondary replicas are rarely accessed, unless you want to do it for locality. If you are running a job and you find there's a second replica, one of the node that's not being used, maybe you'll use that second replica to do the computation to get more efficient parallel computing. Obviously, there's a 200% overhead. All right. So, an example here of, uh, of erasure coding is, suppose we have two things stored, one and zero, and we also store the results of uh, an exclusive OR, and that just happens to be one for this case here, or it's zero for zero plus zero, and one plus one. Then you can easily convince yourself that this one extra bit is able to act as a backup to these two bits. Whereas um, in a replication, you need two extra bits to back up two bits. So you have effectively the same data durability, but you can lose any one bit. So you've actually replaced the amount of storage by, by which used to be four to three. And I say that's the pro. Less storage overhead, half the overhead, but it's slower recovery because you're going to lose some arithmetic. And so here are various um, examples of how to do this thing. Three-way replicate, three-way replication is a, has a data durability of two. XR with uh, six data cells is uh, got a Data durability of one, and you can, it's equivalent having one copy. But there's a storage efficiency of 86%. But here we have these various Reed Solomon codes with different parameters, and they have storage efficiency around 70%, and they can have data durability of three or four, with the four having more computing than the three. So this is an incredibly old technology from the beginning of time. Um, so here's a comment on HDFS blocks. The original HDFS, which was designed for you know, classic big data problems, it's about 128 megabytes, it's not much data. We will just chop all our files up into 128 megabyte blocks and store one block in uh, each data node. So, and now we can do the same thing with the with a parity and have data nodes devoted to parity bits. However, that doesn't work so well for small, small uh, uh, files. And so an alternative is this sort of what I would call a scattered decomposition. You have your 128 megabyte block and you store it, the first megabyte on block zero, second megabyte in block one and so on, and you do your um, you do your read uh, Solomon encoding across this stripe here of a megabyte units. And this allows better parallelism because you're spreading your data over more disks. It allows you smaller files uh, support to be supported because if you have giant if you have giant blocks blocks they don't work if you only have uh, say a hundred megabytes of file. <coughs> Now this also messes up data locality, unfortunately. That's why it's thumbed down for that. Because we spread our original block, which is nice co-located on a single node, into multiple different blocks which may not be stored on the same node. Uh, so this is another picture of the striping, showing how we take the raw data. We do the scattered decomposition. Here are these four different blocks. We do the erasure coding, in this case, two parity bits, and that's uh, how we get our encoding. And then we store everything, the data plus the parity. So they're still working on that, especially improving the support of small files. But as a basic option, you can choose which one you want. The, they are the very understandable. Um, 
basic replication where you actually know exactly what you have to do to get, you know, to get uh, redundancy if one of your data centers catches fire and all the nodes in that data center burn up, where you obviously need to take your multiple copies and store them in different data centers. That's not quite so clear for the um, erasure coding because you don't have a, you have to uh, you don't have quite as many copies and so you're more sensitive possibly to to individual failures of infrastructure. All right, so in Yarn, we not only have the resource uh, management and the scheduler, we have a timeline service, which we haven't really discussed. And there's a version one timeline, uh, which was in Yadoo 2, and a version two time timeline, which is extended in capability, which is in uh, Hadoop 3. All right, so originally MapReduce just had a history server. We store the history of the application, the times when it did things. But the timeline server effectively made this more flexible by having an interface where you could uh, send messages, which effectively uh, stored any, any, any type of data you wanted. And it, this is what the timeline server is. It's now the, it used to be the application history server. And it has things like the names of the user. And the queue names and the application attempts that ran and failed, um, how long they ran for and where they ran, and things like that. The list of the containers which were used and the information about each container. So these are all, you know, in principle you could have if you run, well, you, you, if you have access to the the job that made the. Um, the binaries, you would store the compiler name, the time it was run, the optimization that we use, and things like that. This is all provenance. There's lots and lots of papers on provenance. Um, it's not typically, in general, I would say most commercial systems are not very good at this, because they rush out a system and it's very hard to retrofit this type of information. So in version two, uh, it deals with two things, namely that in the current world we're looking at and actually supported by uh, Hadoop, we want to have data, we want to have workflow or orchestration, having multiple groups of applications linked together, possibly in a pipeline. Um, and then the timeline service supports the uh, data about how they're linked together and what happens about that linkage. And it has um, metrics at the application level and also at the flow level. The flow is a, a collection of applications. And it's done in a rather well-known architecture, which I used to do, use Publish Subscribe to do. Because uh, this is really old technology, conceptually, it just never really gets implemented. So you have a set of collectors, they collect the data you wish to record. And they then send that to a back-end server, which records the data. I mean, logically, the collectors are co-located with the application masters, and every application has its own collectors. So these collectors, which are auxiliary services, are um, attached to the application. And these node managers also can write data to the to the timeline collector on the node that's running the application master. Um, the resource manager itself can have a timeline collector. And it basically uh, uh, collects yarn Pacific or uh, life cycle events to, to keep down the amount of data. But this is a general architecture. Uh, particular users, if they have enough use, will just design their own timeline. So here's an example of this uh, version two uh, timeline. We have a flow which uh, has multiple runs. The runs are multiple applications. These applications might have multiple attempts, because the first attempt got screwed up somehow. And uh, these are all, we use containers, and all this information, and this graph, effectively the specification of this graph, and in date and information about the, each node within the graph. Are stored in the timeline. 